Hi, Mike Gaben here with a KSP tutorial. At the conclusion of the last episode, we left Jeb, Bill, and Bob in low orbit about Minmus in the Kerbal X. In this episode, we're going to be getting them down to the surface and returning them back to Kerbin. The first thing we want to do is pick a landing spot. To make this as easy as possible, we'll land on the day side and look for a nice flat spot. I'm thinking right around here. These blue areas are ideal, as they are perfectly flat. Next, we need to pick where we're going to be starting our initial descent burn. I like to do this about a third of an orbit ahead of my landing location. Coming in shallow makes the landing more efficient, but you do have to be careful that you don't crash into high points of land. For your first landing, I would always recommend Minmus. Though further away from Kerbin, the fuel costs are actually less, as we discovered last episode. It has these wide areas that are perfectly flat, and its gravity is much less than that of the moon, making the landing process much easier. Stick around for Let's Do the Math at the end of the video, where I will be looking at how to calculate the cost of this landing in our return to Kerbin. I'm a bit concerned about this ridge here. Let's maybe warp, time warp just a little bit further. I do want to make sure I clear that. All right, that should do it. Let's put ourselves then on the retrograde vector and start our burn. And uh, I'm just thrusting very slightly. There's a lot of thrust in this vessel. And I'm looking at my blue trajectory. I can come a little bit further than that. And again, I do want to make sure that I clear that ridge that is just before the flats. I think that'll do. All right, we'll put ourselves on the normal vector. Make sure we are catching some rays. Yeah, just gonna have to roll it just a little bit here. And there's not a lot of solar panels on this thing. All right, that'll do. So let's time warp a little bit ahead. Keep an eye on our resources, but uh, nah, everything is fine there. Okay, now we are coming up to this ridge here. You can see it coming up right now. And you can see the altimeter at the top says a little over six kilometers, but you can't trust that. So I'm gonna press C, go into the cockpit. And right here, what we have is a radar altimeter. You can actually see the arrow is moving. We are starting to get some readings off the surface there. Getting a little bit over 2,000 meters to the surface, even though here it's saying on the altimeter at the top of the screen it's 6,000 meters. So that tells us we are just about 2,000 meters there. But if we leave the cockpit, you can see we're under 6,000 meters at the top. The altimeter at the top of the screen is measuring the altitude from the lowest point on Minmus, which actually happens to be these flat sort of frozen seabed type things that we're coming up to. So you do have to be careful that altimeter will not necessarily go to zero um, before you end up hitting the surface. It all depends on how high that surface happens to be. So that radar altimeter in the cockpit could be useful for you. As you can see, we're getting ready for landing now. I've descended the landing gear. I've not put the craft on the retrograde vector. Here, we'll go back. I've actually got it at a pitch of zero just below the retrograde vector. I'll explain that in a second. I've also rolled the craft so that the blue part of the nav ball is up. That means that the top of the craft, <laughs> up on the craft, is actually up on the screen. And I find that this makes it easier for me when I go to do my attitude adjustments up, down, and left, right. Um, it makes it less likely for me to make mistakes. But you know what? I'm getting bored. I want to get down to the surface, so let's do this thing. So we'll start our descent burn. And what I'm just looking to do right here is kill off my horizontal velocity. I'm going to let myself continue to fall, but I'm pushing that retrograde icon up to the top of the nav ball. Now, I do have to pitch up a little bit because I start to lose track of exactly where it is. But I don't want to take off too much of my vertical velocity. I mean, unless it gets to the point where I'm worried I might hit the ground. But clearly, we are still over three and a half kilometers off the surface. I don't have to worry about that. And there we go. We are, actually we're not, shoot. 
<laughs> the velocity on the nav ball was still on orbit. You want that to be on surface. Now that we're on surface, our velocity is relative to the surface, so if I get that retrograde icon right on the top, that means I am falling straight down, which is what I want to do. In some ways, it's kind of similar to doing a rendezvous. You're kind of hurting that retrograde icon. Okay, there we are. We are now falling. We can look at our radar altimeter, and you can see here that it's about 2,500 meters, which is exactly the same as what it is on the altimeter at the top of the screen. That's because the ground here is zero. It's like Minmus's sea level, so to speak. Another reason why Minmus is an easier place to land than the moon. I can just begin to see my shadow, but I'm still going to let myself fall. Another reason, too, is we are falling so much more slowly than we are on the moon. This gives us time to sort of think about things as we go down. You want to put off your braking burn, your final descent burn, to the, I wouldn't go last possible moment, but the later you leave it, the better, the more efficient your landing is. But of course, if you leave it too late, you risk crashing into the surface, which obviously isn't a good plan to have either. So we'll slow ourselves down a little bit. Yeah, just getting to 300 meters. I can clearly see the shadow. Just as here, there it is again. Slow myself down to under about 10 km, 10 meters per second, not kilometers per second. Getting down, we're now under 100 meters. The shadow really helps to sort of see exactly where the surface is. I want to not, I don't want to go up. I want to keep falling down. And right at the end, I want to be between one or two meters per second. Just touch the surface. There we go. Tiny little bounce, but we are now down. And it definitely takes some practice. I've done more than a few of these. So for beginner players, for sure, before you begin that final descent, do yourself a quick save. See how it goes. Practice. Don't expect to get it on your first try. But now that we're down on the surface, well, it's time to do the requisite flag planting. You do got to love how low the gravity is on Minmus. I mean, here, check this out. We'll get Jeb to stop. We'll just jump. And look how high he goes. This is awesome. Alrighty. And in fact, we'll use the EVA pack on our way down. <laughs> Give Jeb a little gentle touch. He should have actually been able to land just fine, given he's the one who put himself up that high, but we'll be nice. And then we'll get out Bob. Bill's turn, sorry. Bill saying, I don't need no stinking ladder. Just going to zip on over here. And then once we got Bob down and we did the flag planting, well, then it was time to start thinking about getting these folks back to Kerbin. So what we want to do first, we want to get ourselves into a low orbit. And just like Kerbin, you generally want to launch towards the east. The big difference is, is that without having to worry about aerodynamics, you can pitch yourself over right away. I like to get over to about 45 degrees. And I gotta get where, oh, it's growing. Cut, cut, cut. <laughs> I don't want my apoapsis. I want it to be at 10 kilometers. So just a little bit more. 10 kilometers, that's it. It doesn't take much to get up there. Bring back up our landing gear. We'll go out to map view. We'll select our apoapsis here. Then we just got a time warp up to there and circularize. Wait a second, what? I can't time warp? Can't time warp under three kilometers? Wimps. Okay, how is our altitude at? All right, there we go, now we can time warp. Okay, so we're just gonna get ourselves up to Apoapsis, and circularizing really works the same way as getting into low orbit around Kerbin or anything else. I'm gonna get myself close to Apoapsis, and just start burning pro or at a pitch at zero until we are uh, got ourselves a nice orbit. 
and uh, I'm going to pull that uh, prograde vector towards the 90 degrees or the east line. That will get us a nice equatorial orbit. I always like equatorial orbits. Okay, let's uh, get ourselves to within about 20 seconds or so of apoapsis. Just start burning gently. It does not take a lot. And again, I like to keep that apoapsis ahead of me, but then I don't want to push it too far ahead of me. So I'm adjusting my throttle accordingly, watching that time to apoapsis as we continue to flatten out our trajectory. Let's just lock it on the prograde vector now. We're close enough. Okay, it was getting a little bit ahead. Just cut throttle for a second, we'll throttle up again. And there's my periapsis on the other side, so select that. Keep burning forward until our periapsis gets up to 20, 10 kilometers. And oh, there we go, that's sweet. We'll put us back onto the normal vector for our solar panels. Yeah, okay, yeah, that's looking fine. Okay, let's talk about how to break orbit and get ourselves back to Kerbin. So, taking a look at Minmus's orbit here, we need to realize that Minmus is moving right now in this direction in its orbit. So if we want to reduce our orbit relative to Kerbin, we need to burn in the opposite direction. We need to eject ourselves from, Ker or from Minmus in this direction. So the place for us to do our burn is going to be right around here. Let's put a maneuver node there, and let's start adding some prograding. You can see that's sort of ejecting us out in the direction that we want to go. There we go, we've now achieved escape velocity from Minmus. Give ourselves a little bit more prograde, and let's take a look at how we're doing relative to Kerbin. So you can see our periapsis, oops, zoom out a bit more, there it is. You can see our periapsis still not nearly enough, so I'll give myself more prograde. Notice as I give more prograde to the burn, my periapsis with Kerbin keeps going down. You can also move the maneuver around. If you grab the node itself, then you can be a little bit tricky. There we go, and you can drag it. Come on, there it goes. Stuck there for a second. <laughs> and if you watch your periapsis as you move it around, you can get a better feel for exactly where it is you should be doing that burn. Just watching the periapsis, looking for the spot where our periapsis is as close as we can get it to Kerbin. I can see I need to give myself some more prograde because what I want to do is I need to get my periapsis into Kerbin's atmosphere and really well into Kerbin's atmosphere. And Kerbin's atmosphere extends to 70 kilometers, so we need to get ourselves well into that. Oops, 75 kilometers, we're getting close. Let's play a little bit more with the exact location of the burn again. If you want to do this with maximum efficiency, you do want to burn in the right place. So we're gonna just select the node, there we go, and move about, and oh, oh, I just put periapsis right into Kerbin. So pull it back a bit. Oh shoot, we got these jump ahead and orbit button things. I don't wanna do that, let's get rid of that. Let's get the, shoot, I need to get the pull handles back. I can't move it around when it's like this. Okay, come on, get that back. Oh, oh dear. I think what happened is that actually move the node right into the Kerbal X. Let's time warp the Kerbal X a little bit forward, see if I can get those pull handles back. No. Oh, shoot. And I can't move it either. Yeah, it does not look like I'm going to be able to get those pull. I think this thing is kind of borked. Okay, we'll have to uh, delete the node here. At least I know right around here, I know that's pretty much the right spot, so this should take very long. This happens sometimes. Give ourselves a little bit more, give ourselves that prograde back. Turn around so we can see what's happening over there at Kerbin. Select our periapsis. Just keep giving prograde until we are 
into Kerbin. Oh, oh, there it is. I lost the uh, dial it back a bit. Periapsis actually went into into Kerbin's surface and disappeared. I am pretty much right in the right spot. I really can't dial it in any closer just by moving, adjusting the timing. Oh, there we go. Right around 25 kilometers. Yeah, that's that'll do. That's going to do it. Okay, so we just got to uh, time warp our way around to our maneuver node. And that's as fast as we can time warp. <laughs> when we're at this low of an altitude. Hey, well, why, why don't we uh, zoom out here a bit? And take another look at our trajectory so people can see what's going on. We are, this is going to be our, basically our elliptical transfer orbit. We're going to fall right down to Kerbin once we are done with this burn. And the burn will only take several seconds, but I won't be using full thrust, so I won't go right to half of that time. All right, we'll put ourselves here onto the maneuver. Time warp ourselves a little bit closer. And just as we come under 10 seconds, we'll start this burn. And I like to position myself so I can see what my orbit is relative to Kerbin, too. Okay, here we go. We're pushing it out. We've just escaped. So we're just going to watch this. We're going to select our periapsis. Keep burning. Again, want to get that down about 25 kilometers was pretty good. Whoa, whoa, what happened? There? I think we got into the moon there a little bit. Okay, let's just finish off the maneuver. We'll watch the, uh, the bar go down. Okay, let's get rid of the node. Select our periapsis. And just give ourselves a little bit. Ooh, oh, down to 17 kilometers. Yeah, that should be fine. <laughs> I could turn myself around retrograde and raise that back up again. But no, it should be good. Might be a little hot. But uh, basically, that is going to be it. All that's left to do is to time warp our way away from Minmus and then keep going until we get close to entering Kerbin's atmosphere. As we get close to the atmosphere, we ditch the service module and then we ride the capsule down just like we've done on a number of other ascents you've seen in this series. In the last Let's Do the Math, we looked at how to use the Delta V map determine the delta v budget for our mission. This time we're going to look at how to calculate these values ourselves. Specifically, we'll calculate the delta v required to get into low orbit from Mimis's surface and how to calculate the cost of the burn that returned us to Kerbin. We're going to do this using nothing but formulas we've already seen. Specifically, our two Hohmann transfer delta v formulas, even though we didn't perform one Hohmann transfer this entire episode, well, you're likely beginning to realize just how useful these formulas are. I've been calling them the home and transfer formulas, but they're more commonly referred to as the vis viva equations. Vis viva is Latin for living force. Another formula we'll be using is the circular orbital velocity formula. There's one more formula, but it won't be coming up for a bit, so I'll save it for later. Here's the Kerbal X sitting on the surface of Minmus, which has a mean radius of 60 kilometers. Imagine we are looking at this from directly above Minmus's North Pole. We want to figure out the cost of getting into a 10 kilometer circular orbit. We got into orbit by performing a burn at the surface and then circularizing at apoapsis. I want to pause and consider this diagram for a moment because, as I'm sure you realize, this isn't really what I did. Specifically, burn 1 here is perfectly horizontal while my actual burn started off vertical and then quickly went over to a pitch of about 45 degrees. What I have here is a simplification to keep the math from getting truly horrific. In fact, I'm assuming that Mimis is a perfect sphere and that burn 1 is performed over such a short period of time that I get up to velocity almost instantaneously. 
That said, the approximation we'll get will be very good, but it's good to realize that it will be a bit low. We'll start our calculations assuming this is a straight up Hohmann transfer from a radius of 60,000 meters to a radius of 70,000 meters. I've used this formula a few times before, so I'll assume that you can make these calculations yourself now. Remember that mu is the standard gravitational parameter for Minmus, and A is the semi-major axis, which is just the average of the two radii. Using the vis viva equations, gets the delta V1 of 6.5 meters per second and a delta V2 of 6.2 meters per second. You don't need to be a rocket scientist to realize that the sum of these two numbers is nowhere near the cost of getting off of Minmus. This is because the vis viva equations are for transferring from one circular orbit to another, and we aren't starting in an orbit here. We're starting on the surface of Minmus. We need to add on the velocity that is required to get an orbit at a radius of 60,000 meters. Putting these numbers into the orbital velocity formula, we get a required velocity of 171.6 meters per second. Now remember, we're not starting from a standstill. Mimis itself is rotating at a speed of 9.3 meters per second at the equator. You can look this number up on the KSP wiki. As we launch to the east, we are already moving at this velocity. To calculate the amount of the burn, we take the orbital velocity we need to get to, subtract the 9.3 meters per second we already have, and then add the first part of the Hohmann transfer to get 168.8 meters per second. Burn 2 is just the second part of the Hohmann transfer, and adding it all up, we get a total required delta V of 175 meters per second. Checking the delta V map, we see that they have 180 meters per second here. This is a result of them rounding up to the nearest 10. Theoretically, landing should cost exactly the same, but I've already mentioned that this value is based upon idealized conditions. I would budget at least an extra 10% for achieving orbit, and likely 25% more for landing. This very same calculation can be done for any world that doesn't have an atmosphere. Now let's look at the cost of getting back to Kerbin. This was done in a single burn, ejecting us from orbit around Minmus, and putting us on a return trajectory into Kerbin's atmosphere. We'll start by simplifying the situation by removing Minmus and imagining the Kerbal X in a simple circular orbit. Minmus' orbit has a radius of 47,000 kilometers, and the burn I set up in the video got me a periapsis of 25 kilometers. This is a straight-up Hohmann transfer between two circular orbits. As the burn is at the higher altitude, we use the second vis viva equation. Substituting in, I want to draw attention to two things. One, I'm now using the gravitational parameter for Kerbin, and two, the higher orbit is the radius measured from Kerbin's center, while the lower altitude is measured from Kerbin's surface, so I have to add on Kerbin's 600 kilometer radius. Punching through a calculator gets 230 meters per second. Note that I don't have to worry about the burn down at periapsis. Kerbin's atmosphere took care of that. Let's bring Minmus back into the equation. The Kerbal X is starting in a 10 kilometer orbit. Before we can begin falling towards Kerbin, we have to first leave Minmus's sphere of influence, or SOI. Within this sphere, the game calculates the force of gravity on the ship using Minmus. Once outside this SOI, we fall under Kerbin's gravitational influence. We have to do more than just leave the SOI, though. We have to exit the SOI with a velocity of 230 meters per second in a retrograde direction relative to Kerbin. We need to calculate the velocity required at, the, at an altitude of 10 kilometers in order to have a velocity of 230 meters per second at a radius of 2,247 kilometers. When I first derived the vis viva equations back in episode 3, I spent a fair amount of time talking about conservation of mechanical energy. While exploring how energy is conserved in an orbit, I developed this equation. This formula relates the velocity and radii of any two locations in an orbit. The orbit doesn't need to be circular. It doesn't even need to be an ellipse. In this formula, V2 is 230 meters per second, R1 is 70 kilometers, and R2 is 2,247 kilometers. What we want is V1. To help out, I'll just rearrange for V1. 
I took the liberty of replacing the V1 with VE, as this will be our required ejection velocity. Substituting in and pushing through a calculator to get 319 meters per second. Of course, it's not like we're at a starting from a standstill. We use our orbital velocity formula one more time to get an orbital velocity of 159 meters per second. This means we need to add 160 meters per second to our current velocity. This will get us exiting Mimis's sphere of influence with the necessary 230 meters per second, which will put our periapsis well into Kerbin's atmosphere. Looking back at the video, we can see that the actual burn was 161.5 meters per second. Not bad. By the way, this technique will not only work for Mimis and the Moon, but can actually be used to calculate the necessary ejection burn to transfer between any two bodies. You now have the ability to calculate for yourself most of the numbers you see on those Delta V maps. And with that, I'll bring this episode to a close. I thank you for watching and hope to see you again next time.